and I'm also known as the original Runway Diva, and you are watching Model Behavior. Class is officially in session. Today, my guest lecturer is a vested, retired member of the Screen Actors Guild and AFTRA. He has worked over the past 40 years as an award-winning actor, singer, dancer, model, puppeteer, magician's assistant, voiceover and ADR artist, college professor, and coach. That's a lot of stuff. Lot of His stuff. career <laughs> travels have taken him to France, England, Germany, Africa, Japan, and the Caribbean. Welcome, Bruce Hawkins, to Model Behavior. You have done a lot, a lot of stuff. Yes, and this is something I'm really happy to be doing, too, because this is an honor for me. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. You're now, welcome. I know you got a lot of stuff that you want to talk about, and half of that stuff is not on the little resume that I just read. <laughs> so let's focus on what okay. it is that you really want to get out there. Um, I want to help people, and I want people to understand that this is a business, mm -hmm. and um, modeling is not about how you look. It's about your brain and understanding how to market yourself. Because the industry has opened up, and I think that there are opportunities for every type of person mm -hmm. to work in the industry. If you have the drive, the persistence, um, you have to look good. You have to look healthy. You don't have to be beautiful um, on any kind of standard. I think in, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, there was a standard of beauty that everybody had to really adhere to. Mm -hmm. But I think advertising has changed, and they look for people that look more real now. And um, that's where I excelled in my career, because I was not the aqualine-looking male model, you know, with the big pecs and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. I was kind of a strange-looking kid and, and teenager, and um, I learned very early on in my career how to make money just being me, which, is, which most people don't even think about. But um, I think in advertising, they're looking for people who look like real people who use their products. So sometimes, especially on my end of modeling, which is commercial print modeling, right, right. Um, you don't want to overshadow the product. So they want somebody who looks like somebody who uses the product but does not necessarily look better than the product, or somebody who's too sexual who will take away from the product. Or someone who will look at it and, and see someone who maybe strikes a, 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 t a chord in them. Exactly, exactly. You, you want somebody who looks like your brother, your sister, your right. uncle, your mother. And I was really good um, because of my acting background. I had a real way of capturing that on film, and I'm a very animated person, so I was not the very still, you know, hold every muscle in place. I'm one of those people, you know, I would just grin and laugh, and they would catch that energy, and that's what, I, you know, that was my selling point, yeah. Now, how long did you, did you, uh, when did you start your career as a... I started, I started modeling when I was 19 years old because I had an afro that was about two feet long, and I looked like um, one of the silvers. Yeah! But I was on the East Coast, they were on the West Coast, yeah. so, so um, I was working at a TV station in Baltimore, and... Um, they were shooting a, a local commercial for a, a guy called the Bush Doctor, and he did afros. And I was a, a, a PA, a, a, an assistant in the studio, and I happened to walk by, and he saw my afro, and he said, I want him. And he came over and said, I want to cut your hair. I said, no, you're not touching my hair. He said, well, can I spray it and pat it? I said, sure. I did a commercial, and it ran in Washington, D.C., and he said his business tripled. Did you get paid for your, for that first gig? No, I didn't. But you, I mean... I didn't. I did. I mean, I just did it because I didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. And then somebody said to me, you know, this commercial's running a lot. And you could make some money off of this. You need to go see a model agent. So I went to a model agent locally, and they looked at me and they said, hmm, nah. Because in the region I was living, um, even though I was looking very good for the 70s, mm, it was right before the whole black power movement. Mm -hmm. And um, it was looked like a real militant kind of image. And I think that that made it scare them off a It scared bit. the advertisers, yeah. So I said, okay, I'm getting on a bus. I'm coming to New York. I'm going to go to every agency and knock on the door. I went to Wilhelmina and knocked on the door. Bang, bang, bang. And I got an interview with Wilhelmina Cooper. Mm -hmm. And Oh, you interviewed with the, the Wilhelmina. Wilhelmina Cooper, yes. Okay. And she walked through, she happened to walk through the lobby. She saw me sitting there. She said, what is this teenager doing? You know. So she said, young man, come in my office. And I went and sat with her. And she talked to me, and she said, 
you're really striking. She said, I'm going to send you to a photographer. Good. So I went to this photographer. I didn't know he was one of the top advertising photographers in, in the United States. And he says, um, I want to shoot you, and this is what you have to do. So he gave me a list of things to get. And I was going to come back at my own expense and do this. Now, in the old days, you didn't pay for photography. You got it for free. If they liked your look, if they liked what you had to offer, they would just shoot you, and you would get the film for free because it was a collaboration. Mm -hmm. Since those days, everybody has taken advantage of each other, so now photographers charge you to test you, which is called a test. Right, right. Um, so we arranged a big test, and right before I was about to do the test, I got into a Broadway show. Really? <laughs> yeah. So I was pulled away from the modeling industry. Um, but I still went out on auditions and calls, and I went to agencies. I went to one agency, and they said, you got to cut your hair. And I knew my hair was my selling point. Um, I was doing a Broadway show, and I was playing a teenage drug addict and a junkie, but he had a huge afro, and they talk about it in the script, so I couldn't cut my hair. So I decided um, I was going to finish out my show, and I was going to be a model, and it didn't work out, because I finished the show, and my parents said, you come back to school, get your degree. Uh, finish that yeah. degree. And I'm like, you know, do I want to do this? I don't Come back and finish. So I went back home, and when I went back home, um, just so happened that Essence Magazine was shooting on our college campus, and Susan Taylor invited me to be a part of her staff in the college. Mm -hmm. So I helped to, you know, arrange shoots and do things like that, and I learned a lot, and I did a lot of really hard but good work, and Susan said, if you ever come to New York, look me up. So, so you just, isn't it, a, it's, it's amazing how the stars just aligned for you. My whole life has been that way. It's been that way. It's been really crazy. So I went to visit Susan, and um, she sat me in her office, and she said, well, I don't have anything right now. She said, but what skills do you have? And I said, well, I do makeup, and I do, well, who have you worked for? And I said, well, you know, I've just graduated from school, and I've done makeup locally, but I haven't done, she said, well, when you start working, come back and talk to me, and we'll see. So I went right out and got a job doing makeup, and um, I worked at Bloomingdale's as a counter manager for a makeup company from London, and uh, my boss is named Madeline Mono, and she, she sold this Indian eye makeup. And you actually rimmed your eyes with, you know, this makeup. And I needed to prove myself. I, there was no other way for me to do it, so I used to wear it every day to work. You wore the, the, the I makeup? I wore the eye makeup in blues, greens, blacks, all different kinds of colors. And um, I was the talk of the floor. Everybody on the floor was like, look at this guy walking around with this eye makeup. I'm, I made so much money because people came flocking over just to talk, and I had hired some other girls to work with me who were stri I mean, just strikingly gorgeous. I said, you don't have to sell anything. Just stand in the mirror and put your makeup on. And that's what they did. And they kept making themselves up, and these girls were just naturally beautiful. Mm -hmm. There was no makeup that was going to make them any better. <laughs> but this, girl, this one girl we had had purple hair in the 70s. Wow. And she would put her makeup on, and the women were coming by the whole counter. So, of course, Bloomingdale's was looking at us like, what is this phenomenon? So then they enlarged the counter. I got a raise in pay. And my boss then said, okay, I want you to start going out to the magazines. I said, well, I have a magazine I can work for. And I went to Essence, and I said, Susan, here's my proof. And Susan said, okay, I'm taking you to Washington, D.C. So I did, a, I did a cover and 12 pages inside of Essence on my first job for Essence magazine. Get the knife. Get yeah. out of here. <laughs> and that started my career. And after that... Um, I had two careers going, because I had studied ballet as a kid, and I came to New York really to model and dance. You were sitting here telling me you danced, too? Yeah, yeah. So I was taking class at the Ailey School on my lunch break, and we had it worked out that we could jump from place to place to place. I would take class on my lunch break. The girls would man the counter, and then I would come back and close out. And um, I kept dancing, got into a dance company. So then I was doing makeup and dance at the same time. The skills are the same. Because when you're dancing, of course, you want to look otherworldly and all that kind of stuff like that. So we did all that. And um, I began doing makeup backstage for the different dancers and stuff like that. This thing mushroomed into a career because an art director saw my work and said, um, I do casting under the table. So if you don't have an agent, I will pay you $100. You show up, and I will have plenty of work for you if you want to work. I said, okay. I said, who are your clients? He said, I just have small clients, but we'll see. My first job was for um, Avon Cosmetics, uh -huh. and the model I worked with was Beverly Johnson you for, know, for a 12-hour day. Wow. <laughs> yep. And that it, is crazy. It was, Avon was, at the time, doing a black makeup catalog, and it was the first one they did, and they hired the 10 top black models in New York, 
and I was the makeup artist. And I was hired because I was fast. I could really change makeup very quickly. And that turned into an award-winning campaign. So I did Beverly Johnson, I did Iman, I did Peggy Dillard, I did Barbara Smith, I did everybody. And they were, some of the girls were separate and they were holding lipstick tubes and all kinds of cosmetics and stuff. And that really got me an agent because an agent saw my work and said, I want you to work with us. So I was signed with Beauty Bookings, which was a top flight makeup agency, but I was at the bottom of the roster. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the modeling career had kind of fallen off. So I was like, okay, now we gotta do something with that because when you're dancing, you only dance 40 weeks out of a year. You don't dance an entire 52 weeks, so you have time off. If your company goes on tour, you dance, dance, you come home, and then you have a break. I needed to make money so I could pay my rent. So the makeup helped, and I, the modeling would come as I decided to test with different photographers. So um, I started testing with some Japanese photographers and doing really crazy, outlandish stuff. Now how are you finding these photographers? Um, networking. It's real important that you have an open personality and that you talk to people. I'll agree with that. And you have to talk to people, but you cannot dominate them. You have to allow them to give you information, and you have to allow them to discover you. Um, one of my friends was working in advertising, and she said, I have a Japanese friend who's here who wants to shoot a model. And they took me to the studio and put all these really wild clothes on me, and, and the pictures came out absolutely gorgeous. And I took those around to the agency, and they were still like, well, oh, I don't know. You don't really fit the clothes. You're not the right size. I said, okay, whatever. Meanwhile, dancing led to doing runway work, because at the time, it was the Studio 54 generation. Mm -hmm. Everybody was going out partying at night. And I met a guy who had a clothing line that was specifically built for guys who were thin. And I was six feet tall, and I weighed 127 pounds. And he was my he was British thin. counterpart. He looked exactly like me, but he was the designer of the line. And he was very wealthy and, and came to New York to do all the sportswear shows. And he said, I could use you. Can you dance? I said, sure. So he dressed me up in suits, and I went out on the runway and danced with a female dancer, and they would sell the clothes on the runway. So I started doing that kind of work, and then an agency said, we want you. Isn't and that I something? was working you already. You were getting all the gigs on your own. I was getting gigs on my own, exactly. And that's the way you have to be. You have to be enterprising in this business, and you have to hustle constantly. So my first agency was called Funny Face. I remember that agency. But that was like the first real people agency. The first real people agency. And you were judged in those days not by how beautiful you were, but, you know, what kind of faces you could make. You mm -hmm. know, if you could be animated, if you could be funny, if you could do stupid things on camera. And I was real... That was like playtime for me. Mm -hmm. So um, I started working with Funny Face as a new face, and then um, from there I started going on better auditions and go-sees. Now, if you know anything about the process, commercial print means that you're going on auditions probably once, twice a week, and you're going to represent products. So you could be representing a pharmaceutical drug, liquor, cigarettes. And it also means that it's it's not the, it's not quite the same as going on a a Run of the mill go see because no. you have to you you, it, you have to put some acting skills in you that have to because put your acting you're, skills. it's about selling a product it's not really about it's about how you look but it's more about your ability to sell that product absolutely and it's also how you handle the product you may have to hold a burger and you may have to bite into the burger so you have to know how to eat and how to hold the product so that the product looks better than you do mm -hmm. you have to look good but the product has to look better. Um, and I started going out on stuff and started booking. Now, I was told by a model friend of mine that I met along the way that you're going to 100 auditions, you may book two jobs. So you gotta be going out constantly. Yep. I learned very early on in the business that I could not go on those many auditions unless I had more than one agent. Mm -hmm. So I was a freelancer. I've always been a freelancer. I've never signed with anybody. Because when you sign with one person, you only get that one person's contacts. If you freelance, every agency you're with, you're getting contacts from different places. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it's a little different now, though, isn't it? Because I, I know with the, not commercial print, which may be different, but with the, fashion, uh, fashion yeah. they don't want you to, they to freelance. They don't want you to work with anybody else. They want else. you to have one agent. And That's right. It, it gets a little kind of tricky. But that was because the fashion industry, when I, when I first started modeling, either you were fashion or you were commercial. Commercial was looked at as the bottom of the barrel. And the fashion people didn't want to touch the commercial people until they saw how, how much, much money? money we were making. Yes. A fashion model would go and do a, do a runway show and come home with $1,000. I would spend one day on a set and do a product. 
and I'd come up with $5,000 in my pocket. So once the fashion people realized that the commercial print people were making all the money, all of a sudden every fashion agency had a commercial division. Mm -hmm. And they started sending out these beautiful people on these, you know, the problem was a fashion model will come and impose themselves and be all this, but it takes away from the product, where a real person will come in and just hug it and say, here I am, and they get that warmth and mm -hmm. human mm -hmm. feeling that they want. Now I see you holding this, this portfolio here. This is my Bible, and this, this is what everybody has to have. Now, I'm old school, so this is an old book. It's a nice book, too. Thank you, thank you. But this is, this is your Bible. This is your calling card. Wherever you go, you open your book, and bam, they see who you are. And that's even for commercial print models, not just commercial print, fashion models. Commercial print. Fashion models have a different way of showing themselves. Mm -hmm. um, commercial print people have to show us. We have to show ourselves in different ways. We have to show ourselves as... Can we get close up on this, guys? <laughs> We have to show ourselves in family situations mm. where, you know, I could be a grandfather and have grandkids, you know. I could be playing, the, you know, with my dad, you know, on the piano and doing all that kind of stuff. Um, I worked as a, I worked as a hand model for many, many years, so I have to show my hands and feet and everything. So, you, you know, it's the same, it's the same rigmarole, but you want to show this a is, range. Yo, this is fascinating. And this is my Bible, so. Yeah, okay, let's lift it up a little okay, bit. Okay, all right. So when you go, when you go to an agency and they, they're trying to decide whether they want to work with you, you want to show a range of, of people who you are, what you can be, the kind of work you've done in the past, where you can go, the animation, the expressions me, you can show. Let me just say that most people don't know about this piece right here. And I'm going to explain body parts. that. Body parts. you can make a lot of money make with a that. Lot of, and I've been doing body parts for 40 years. Um, as you can see, and you hold all kinds of products, you know, so your hands have to be perfectly manicured and you have to keep up with this, just like you keep up with your face, hopefully, mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Um, and I've done a lot, as you can see, a lot of hand modeling and stuff, but I've also done a lot of character work, where I play like policemen, doctors, lawyers, and in the, in the 80s and the 90s, I was considered to be a young urban professional, a buppy, and that's the work that I capitalized on. So I would get everybody. This is you? That's a doctor. Yep. Wow. Doctors, lawyers. Um, because of my dance background, I was very animated in front of the camera, so people loved that. Now, are you still working as a, a, yeah. a commercial print model? I'm 63 years old, and I'm still working. I just booked my last job about two weeks ago. You better go ahead, Bruce. I'm <laughs> yeah, not even yeah, mad you, at you. You don't have you to ever stop ahead. as a commercial print model. A fashion model has a time limit, and they, they look at the industry. Unfortunately, this is all about money. The industry has standards that they set, and so your size, your look, your age, all determines how you're going to work and how much money you're going to make. Unfortunately, advertising is run by a committee. Mm -hmm. It's not one person making the decision. Nowadays, it's an entire committee. You go to an audition, there might be five people in the room, and everybody is picking you apart. Um, so you need to have yourself. You have to have a really good sense of yourself. Good sense of self. You have to be pleasant at all times. No negativity whatsoever. Because the moment that you're negative or you're, you, you frown up your face, they say this person's going to be difficult to work with. Mm -hmm. You're ex from the competition immediately. You have to have all of the equipment, all the tools. You have to be professional. You have to come in dressed kind of nice. You don't have to be overdone, but you have to be nice. But you also have to hit everybody behind that table. So somebody's looking at you and saying, uh, well, you look a too, little too fat. You look a little too old. You look a little too this. You have to charm all of them to make them understand that you have the energy and mm -hmm. the wherewithal to sell that product. Because they're spending large amounts of money to advertise. And if your face is going to be all over billboards and stuff, they want to make sure that they get the best possible representation they can get. Um, a lot of times the decisions have nothing to do with you. It's And I always say that it's not personal. It's not personal. It's business. You're just not the right fit for that, for that product. product. But there will be another product next week. Absolutely. And you go out for that one. And you make sure your agents are sending you out constantly so you're constantly going out getting stronger, more confident, and happier. You know, sometimes you just go in an audition room and make everybody laugh. You got the job right there. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. your agent's not going to send you unless you have the equipment to go. Um, there are also people, there is a perception that to be a beauty, that you have to be a certain size, you have to look a certain way, that's all changed. Because of the internet, we're global now. Mm -hmm. So we see people of all sizes, shapes, and colors. And you have to be the rep best representation of who you are as a person. You know, if, if you know what your niche is, then you fit into that niche, but you want to be the best one you can. And I'm glad you said that because I know a lot of models and I see a lot of stuff 
on Facebook and on Instagram, mm -hmm. and everybody thinks they're going to be the next Naomi Campbell or the plus size, this, that, and the third. And they, they don't pay attention to things. I mean, the bottom line should be you want to make money. Thank you. And if you can make money selling tampons or soup or whatever, why would you not do that? Everybody wants to do the exotic shoots and be on the cover of magazines. It's That's about right. having a steady career. And paycheck. Yes, a steady <laughs> There you go. And if you can, the same thing with fit modeling. If you can get three fit jobs during the week, pay $250 mm -hmm. an hour That's right. for a two-hour booking every That's day, right. you just made $1,500 for just standing there. That's right. But these chicks, they just, they want to be centerfold they models. They have to they understand want, you know, there, there are different types of modeling. First of all, you could be a beauty model. So you don't have to have a, a nice body necessarily, but your hair, your skin, your teeth have to be perfect. You know, and they'll just shoot you from the neck up, and they're looking at those things. Hand models, part, body part models, you have to have perfect parts, and you have to know how to use your parts. You can't just walk in with your hands looking any kind of way. You have to know how to fold them and turn them, mm -hmm. and you know, how to take the veins out of your hands. There's little tricks that you learn along the way. There's fit models. If you have a perfect body that fits the standard industry sizes, mm -hmm. which we have to talk about, because now the industry has opened to plus, so there are fit models that just do plus, but you have to be perfectly proportional because the sample sizes are what you're going to be wearing and what mm -hmm. they're fitting on you. They determine the sample sizes by sales. So they go out and do a demographic study and they figure out how much money can we make with this particular garment? How much money can we make with this pair of pants? And then they hire the model to fit it on who has the shape that is most common to all of the research that yep. they have done. Yep. yep. People don't understand that because they go in and say, oh, my booty is popping and I can look good. No, honey, it's not about you. <laughs> it's not about you. You may have a beautiful body and you may think in your neighborhood you look good, but when you step into an industry standard, you have to fit the standard. And you cannot change that standard unless you're a celebrity. If you're a celebrity and they bring you in and they know you have a track record and you're bringing money. And you have a following. And you have a following, which is something else I wanna talk about. If you have a following, then they're gonna say, okay, we're gonna spend even more money because this is somebody who's gonna bring more money to our table. Mm -hmm. That's why now when you look at magazines, models are out, celebrities are in. The Kim Kardashians. The, bloggers. Yes, yeah, bloggers. They're in because they have a following. An agent told me last week, and this is the third time I've heard this. If you have no social media following, you're dead in the water. Because the first thing we look at is your book. Yeah. We look at you, and then when we walk out of the room, we go to the computer, we Google you, and we look at your social media following. So if you only have 10 friends on Facebook, you can't bring nothing to the table. Mm. So you have to have that. You so know you, what I'm saying? Listen, boys and girls, you need to learn this stuff, because I just recently, I mean, I've been a Facebook junkie for a minute, Me but too. Instagram <laughs> and Twitter, right. and stuff, I still don't know how to tweet. But I'm learning. But you got to learn it and you got to do it because that's the trend. That's the way that fa fashion goes in trends and you have to go off the trend. Um, there's also, like if you have an athletic body, if you really are built well and your body is proportional, there's a whole section of modeling you can do just doing athletic wear and exercise and demonstrating exercise. And there are agencies that do just that. And I don't, let me just say, I, I personally, mm -hmm. the tattoo thing, that's not me. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't like the marking up of the body. Mm -hmm. But there's modeling for that, too. There's there are agencies that specialize for mm -hmm. people who have tattoos and piercings all in their That's face. Right. So you got to learn how to, well, one, you got to have the sort of drive and determination that you have. You can't turn it on on Monday and then Tuesday, Wednesday, you want to lay off. You have to constantly be on your hustle. Okay, well, let me say this about that, Sharon. Um, there are days when I don't get out of my bed and I pull the covers up over my head and I feel like, you know, nobody's ever going to hire me again. And I may have just worked last week. It is, it is a cycle that goes up and down, and you have to prepare yourself to create a continuum that you can stay focused and positive. There are gonna be weeks when you're not gonna feel good. There are gonna be weeks when you don't look good. There are gonna be weeks when you don't have the energy to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, every, if you go on a, auditions every week for a year and you don't book anything, you're gonna get depressed, you're yeah. gonna get, and that brings your spirit down. So you have to always be doing things in your life too that keep your spirit elevated so that every audition that you get becomes a blessing and you go in and you're positive and they see that from behind the table. The moment you walk through the door, your audition begins. There you go. It does not begin at the table. It does not begin when you put your hands on your hips and no, you think you're Miss Naomi. They're watching what kind of attitude you have when you come in, the sort of confidence, how Absolutely. you carry yourself. Because this is what I do when I go on the road casting. Like a lot of girls think that the audition begins when they hit the mark. No, 
It begins when they open the door and Thank you, you walk that, through. There was a famous photographer who used to sit in the waiting room with the models, and nobody knew who he looked like or who he was, and he would sit there, and the models would come in, they'd be gossiping about one another and, you know, cat fighting and stuff like that. And he would sit there and say, I can't work with them because they're going to be a problem on this set. And when you're a problem on a set, you cost people money. There you go. And when you cost people money, you're gone. You may book one job, but you won't book a second And they one. will write you a check and send you home the same day. Exactly. Thank you. We do, no, this Thank is not going to work. And then they call your agency and tell them you are a problem, and then your agency stops setting you up. Yep, don't send her to me anymore. I've exactly. seen it happen. Yeah. So it pays to have a pleasant attitude. Always. And just mind your business. Thank I you. say this all the time. If you're on set, get you a book. Thank Get your you. little iPod Thank and you. wait until it's your turn. Thank Don't you. be gossiping with the makeup artists because they are like tape recorders. They're going to take this stuff back to the producers. Makeup and hair people can make a career, too. They if can they make, like you, yeah, they can make yeah. If they don't like you, they can not only screw you up in front of that camera, they can also destroy your career. Yes. So you have to be very careful. Um, so with all that said, there are many different areas in the modeling industry that you can work in. Um, what you have to do is models today don't do their homework. Jesus. They don't do classes in session. You have to do your homework. There you, go. you have to open magazines and find yourself in the magazine. What ma Black Enterprise? I'm perfect for that. I wear a suit well. I look good. Uh, Essence. Oh, I'm, I have a really natural urban feel that I know. Essence and let's is. go with the look you have. Thank you. Not don't the try one to change. You want. Thank you. Okay. Don't try. Don't try to change it. Be who you are, but be the best that you can be. But find where your niche is in the industry and find an agency that deals with that. That's where you start. And then once you get in and a hairstylist looks at you and says, I'm going to shave your head and make you somebody different, then you can change and become something else. But you can't do it yourself. You can't. Because so many, I see so many people coming into auditions and going on auditions who think that it's all about them. It's never about you. It's about the money and the paycheck at the end of the day. Yes. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. All right, guys, we are out of time. I'd like to thank my guest, thank Mr. You. Bruce Hawkins, for sharing his industry knowledge with us today. Before I go, I'd like to leave you with a few final thoughts. Remember that you can't change the game until you first learn the game. Surround yourself with positive people and positive things. Do what you love and love what you do. And lastly, because of you, Bruce, remember that to be early is to be on time. To be on time is to be late, and to be late is unacceptable. Uh, until next week, thanks for watching Model Behavior, and I'll see you guys next Saturday at 11.30. Make sure you remember to like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest. Hey, did you miss an episode of Model Behavior? Now you can catch up on all the prior episodes of the show by checking out our new YouTube channel. Class is officially dismissed. Bye, y'all.